Can you start with the TED Talk? How did that come about? I was invited to speak for TED Women in the year previously. That was in San Francisco, and in fact was tech nil. I couldn't do it. So the next year they invited me to TED Proper, which was fine, you know, having <laughs> gone to that stage, because they'd heard me rehearse. First time anyone mentioned TED to me, I sort of said, what's TED? If you think about it, compared to universities with lectures and theses, um, somehow TED is this com compact ideas. It's a different way of, of learning. And uh, I found it quite exciting. My TED Talk's been viewed by over two million people and it has brought in responses from all over the world. Ted referred to me as the entrepreneur that nobody's ever heard of. But I'm focused, and that's very important in business. Concentrate on that. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to come here and meet you. Um, it's not really work, it's just something I do. I was watching one of your many videos online and you kind of said that you've just always, your work was just something that you loved and you've always, you've mm. always done it. As a refugee, I really decided to make mine a life that was worth saving and so I have become very dutiful, very um, boring, very um, committed to not frittering my life away and so even at the grand age of 85 I'm still working and um, because work to me is not just something I do when I'd rather be doing something else. I can't imagine anything more fun. So you knew what your purpose was and you made that about your work. Do you remember the first time that you really started feeling that? Oh, very early. I knew that in my childhood. People were, I think, less understanding of children in those days. And they would say things like, aren't you lucky to be saved? Uh, this is saved from Nazi Europe. And uh, yes, I am very lucky to have been saved. Um, but it's not a healthy thing to say to a five-year-old. We shouldn't have to justify our own survival. So very early on, it, it, you know, I've got to do something with my life. So no harm done, no harm done. I have a great life. I really enjoy my quality of life now. And what does a typical day look like? How does it start and finish? Well, I tend to go out Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays and have days in the office, my study. I like the quiet days in at my desk. Um, I think the act of creation is, is a solitary one, so I'm interested that you've started with a partner. I need a lot of time um, by myself actually to think of new ideas. I need that quiet time, not at meetings. There's no real pattern. I always say now I don't work weekends, but I'm working for Holocaust Memorial Day, which happens to be a Sunday, and, and you know, it does happen. And so I like to um, be active, I look back at how I started the business and in no way would I have dreamt that it would ever be so successful. It was really something that I started for myself um, and for other women um, in order to get round some of the sort of sexism that yeah. we had um, in the corporate world then. And you get opportunities and you've just got to grab them when they're there. Was there a particular straw that broke the camel's back and you just thought, enough? Well, in my first job, and I started working at 18, I mean, there were literally formal salary scales. One for salary scale for the men, and another lower scale for the women, doing exactly the same role, because this was desk work. Um, and that really made me very um, aggressive and, and assertive and, you know, I was really sort of saying I, I believe in equal pay and, and um, Later it was more um, covert that people would sort of just gently ease you out of the mainstream yeah. and so on. And I just got fed up with it. I'm trying to like get into your head of, of what it was like to be 29 and sitting at your dining room table and just, did you have a business plan? Did you have a vision? <laughs> what, what, what was going through your head when you thought, I'm doing this and this is... I, 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 was, I was starting <laughs> yeah, a crusade for women. It was not to make money, it was not even, it was to keep me intellectually active, I think there was, uh, that was part of it. I had no idea how quickly one would move out of the software area, which I loved and was passionate about, at a time when software was given away free with the hardware. It was a very um, assertive thing to do and very, very amateur. Um, I sat at my dining room table, 
um, made a few notes perhaps and, and waited for the telephone to ring. And of course it really didn't. We had some early introductions, very good ones, from previous colleagues and staff. We worked for British Rail um, very early on and to have a name like that, huge. huge. Yeah. And um, their centre was up in Darlington. They'd never travelled first class before, <laughs> you know. So there were all sorts of sort yeah. of perks. Do you think, why? Oh, I really am getting to be a businesswoman in my own right. Do you remember what that first project was with them? That was scheduling freight trains for them. So an operational research job, quite, quite complex. I think we'd have about six people working on it for three months, something like that. So there were significant chunks of work and very much at the, at, at the frontier of science. When you first started, you were doing some of the programming and, and actually being that quite That was my handsome. idea that I was going to do it. At quietly at home and this wonderful creative work and manage my own time and so on. And very quickly in business, I found myself having to delegate the actual technical work and I found myself inundated with human resources issues, tax, solicitors, corporate governance and selling. And that's what I finished up doing, selling and marketing. Yeah. So I quite like sales. I like sort of the thinking about solutions and in selling, you're, you're, you're listening for problems and thinking, I wonder if I could solve that. You use the name Steve. Can you tell us a bit more about that? You would not believe how amateur I was. Um, I was writing letters um, by the dozen, really, to potential customers and signing them with, it, with this double feminine of Stephanie Shirley and getting absolutely no response whatsoever. And my dear husband, who was involved in the business in those days, sort of said, well, maybe it's the name. Why don't you use the family nickname of Steve? So I wrote the same letters to the same sort of people, writing Steve Shirley. And I began to get some, some meetings. Wow. And, uh, How did that make you feel? Because, I mean, on, on one hand, you're like, okay, I'm in. It's funny, and funny, ha ha. Yeah. I mean, you know, but it's disgusting. Yeah. How did it make you feel about doing business with those, those, those people? Oh, I'd grab anything that moved. <laughs> <laughs> I always say yes. In 1975, the Equal Opportunities legislation came in. You had to let men in. <laughs> Well, you would, you would you... think I would be delighted to actually have that legislation going through, and to a certain extent I was. Um, but it did make our pro-female policies absolutely illegal. As we'd always employed a few men anyway, uh, but then we, we started doing 50-50 recruitment. And eventually, when the company was really sizable, we finished up for many years 60-40, but the difference was it was 60% female because of our female start, 40% yeah. male. And then the company started doing acquisitions and stuff like that. And even that went, so we finished up 90-10, same as everybody else. But that's life, isn't it? We've been going 40 years. Yeah. Did the dynamics change when the, the men started coming in? Well, the first few men coming in were a disaster. Um, we didn't know how to recruit them. We were. Um, bamboozled by their confidence, by the way in which they made claims which we never thought of questioning. So it, the first few were a disaster, then eventually we got more professional about it. And of course now, uh, if you're recruiting, uh, you anonymise all the details when they come in so that you can't, you're not conscious that this is a man or a boy, yeah. this is a woman or a girl. Yeah. Um, and that's it's how it should be, really. Yeah. But a professional manager would specify the task to be done. These are the qualifications that I need. These are the characteristics of the person that I'm looking for. And recruit against that. Have they got the same sort of values? And I'm talking about ethical values. Yeah. Um, and then I could teach them to do whatever it is that needs doing. And if they've got, you know, the, the learning, the, you know, people who love to learn, then they will get there very quickly. You say that women hold themselves back in business. Why do you think that is? What I observe really is that women are not really prepared to pay the price of success. Leadership in, in, in business is tough. It's 24-7. Um, it's unrecognised while you're small. You know, people are very polite to me now. 
Um, but when you're sort of struggling a little company, people laugh, they, they stab you in the back, all sorts of things. So I think women are um, culturally not geared up for the sort of carnivorous um, environment of business. It is tough. Um, it's not, if it was easy, we'd all be millionaires. Um, and, and we just have to learn um, as women, is this something we want to do? What advice would you give to young women starting up their own business today? Exactly the same as I would for young men. Um, find something that you really enjoy, um, get trained in it, um, get trained again so that you're really up to speed and then just go for it. A lot of businesses do fail. There's no disaster. You can start another one or do something else. But it can be such, so rewarding. And I don't mean just financially. It really can be great fun. And the people that you work with in, 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 a, in a young organisation, they become friends for life. Yeah. My best friend yeah. started off as my secretary, yes. That's fantastic. <laughs> she was an awful secretary. <laughs> <laughs> what does success look like to you and what does it mean to you? Success is, um, um, is actually choice. It, it allows me to choose, choose what we do on holiday, choose what, where we live, um, not always restricted by money. And I mean, I've been poor for a long, and I mean poor, for a long, long time. And it's such a relief not always to worry about the cost. To get out of that feeling that money is so important, it becomes more, it just gives you choice. Yeah. We live pretty modestly um, and um, haven't really changed our lifestyle all that much. If I was a paper millionaire for many, many years. In other words, the business was good, I owned all the shares, um, I hadn't started giving the shares away, um, but I still had, was thinking, can I afford a new pair of tights? I was quite possessive about the company. Um, I, I held on to it for quite a long time. And so my book is called Let It Go, meaning that you actually realise I could share the ownership as well as everything else. You quoted that the art of surviving life's cruelties and triumphs is learning to let it go. There's a lot of talk about mental health, yeah. and certainly I had problems with mental health, partly because of working, but more because of my profoundly vulnerable child. Um, and I really kept it very much to myself. My colleagues hardly knew that uh, they knew I had a child and that I perhaps had a bit of difficulty with them. I had no idea what was going on at home. With experience is that it's important to share. Let it go by talking to friends and colleagues. Um, from the management point of view, I found showing my weaknesses got me much further. Would you have a go at it? And that sort of style got me much further, um, was much more pleasant, um, and so it became a very friendly, fun place to work. We worked very, very hard. But what I expect to hear when I walk around is roars of laughter and things like that. What would be your advice to people working with programmers? Despite the flexibility, I think customers really need to um, get to know the people, uh, meet them, check them out, uh, that they fit in culturally into their own environment. Um, and that they are, and, and speak to previous customers. We would bid for the contract and give details of the sort of people who would be working on it. And together, I mean, this is the whole thing about team working. Together we can do such a, so, such a super job. Do you remember having a particular project that was just, just went wrong? This is what happened on a particular contract. She was brilliant, I won't give her name. She was a double first from Dublin, which is very good on mathematics. And she was doing a small job for um, an oil company. Um, and um, after a few weeks, the oil company contacted me and sort of said she's using an inordinate amount of machine to computer time, which is very expensive in those days. And it, it was in one God Almighty muddle, it was in a terrible muddle. And um, I think the company could have gone bust on that one because I had to drop everything else, um, learn a new computer language, build up a team of three and descend on it and get it, because we had a timescale to meet. 
Um, and that um, disaster really proved quite useful for the company because afterwards we all sort of said, we're never going to let that happen again. We set up project controls on this and cost controls on that and much tightened up on all, all our systems. Um, and we've never had such a disaster again. The gig economy, what's your thoughts on it today? I noticed that politically, zero hour contracts are considered to be poor management. We used them for many years. They were perfectly acceptable to both us and um, the freelancers. We used a modification of them in the Netherlands and that worked very well. Um, so cultures change. We had a lot of um, pioneering work. Uh, we did one of the first job shares. Um, a husband and wife came to us and said, can we have do one job between us? We never really thought about that. Why not, you know? So spent a bit of time working out on a, a contract and off we went. The most revolutionary thing we did, I think, w which still is very seldom used, is we paid people on a cafeteria of benefits. So every year people would sort of say, well, I want direct pay or I want uh, less direct pay and more pension or a bit better company car. Or, but they had that sort of flexibility, not just in time and place, but also how they were remunerated. And that hasn't taken off yet. But the gig economy is worldwide. That's how the flexibility. Yeah. It, it makes you very agile. You can do things in the business. Yeah. We're going to need that after Brexit. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of common sense to keep fixed costs down and keep that flexibility because you don't know what next year's business is going to be and it does go up and down. I dislike bureaucracies um, and I think the gig economy is the very opposite of that. What was it like letting go? Mostly I'm just very proud that I've done it. It certainly um, energised the organisation in a way that no manager, and certainly not me, could have done. It was their company, they really loved it, and it, it blossomed uh, under co-ownership. Um, when I lost control of the company, then it was a little bit like Shakespeare's King Lear, when uh, having given away his kingdom, if you remember, his daughters were uh, no longer treated him like, like the king. And that, that certainly happened. I found that very, very painful. Um, but that was a choice that I had made, and I did get through it. I'm a very proud person, and I wasn't going to let anyone see how upset I was. So to a certain extent, I kept away from things. Um, and made very sure that I'd got a big smile on my face and um, was very, very nice, thank you very much, and kept quiet about it. Do you ever visit them? Are you still engaged? Well, surprisingly enough, I think you've asked me that. Um, I mean, I retired 25 years ago. Um, I went, after 40 years, they were acquired by a French company and I had some dealings with them. and. Last year, we had this company reunion, which was funded by the French company. So it's still linking. Yeah. The interesting thing about that, I suppose, is 25 years, and the culture is amazingly strong. So what you do in the early days of, a, of an organization is very, very important. Because some of my cultural things, the co-ownership is still in that company, you know? And I've been retired 25 years ago, and I can still see they're, the they're still using my, my, my words. Yeah. That's good. I'm very happy with that. You, you said, and I picked up on this, that people remember entrepreneurs because of our successes, but it depends far more on how you deal with failures. Can you elaborate on that a bit and how you dealt with, with a few failures? One of the sort of management terms that people use now is resilience, and one uses it for children as well, whether you can recover from the fall on the stony ground, the lost contract, the uh, business disaster that takes you into new areas. 
Um, some people can do it and some can't. I think I can, and I think that dates right back from having my refugee start. I've been an unaccompanied child refugee. I've lost my only child. What else can life throw at me? And it gives you a sort of, well, it is as it is. Um, I've survived those, I'll survive the next problem. Uh, but there are some skills that perhaps one needs to develop, largely financial skills, which I find very, very boring and very difficult. Um, but without those financial skills, how can you track what's happening in your organisation? Feely Feely is very, all very well, but you really need those financial results and watch them month after month. Was that your thought process even from day one? Were you that invested in checking monthly and making sure the no, figures made sense? No, to begin with, I was all full of trust. <laughs> it was all going to be all right. Well, it, it, it doesn't stay all right unless you really work out. <laughs> so when did, when did that shift in thinking happen? I mean, we did start very amateur. Girls didn't get any commercial training at school. I had no idea how to price or anything like that. Well, I started off idiotically thinking in terms of how much my salary would be um, and dividing that into hours and trying to do some arithmetic like that. And of course, it, it was far, far too low. The pricing stayed wrong, too low, for about 25 years. Wow. <laughs> and when I got a professional manager in, um, and we'd spent days, weeks, months actually, this is how we do this, this is how, this, let me show you what we do here and how we got this and all that sort of thing. And she'd say, yes, yeah. She said, you do what? <laughs> and there were some real sacred cows were sort of slaughtered at that time. Pricing was wrong. So we got a sort of profitless prosperity. We were growing, we were covering our costs, uh, we were, uh, in, except in one year, turning in some profit, um, but it, it wasn't really stable until the pricing got right. I mean, people think in terms of um, overnight success for entrepreneurs. Microsoft took 10 years, so it's quite wrong to think that you or I could, could tomorrow get payback from a company. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a long game. Yeah. Tell us about the film. Well, it's rather exciting to think that uh, my memoir, and there's a difference between a memoir and an autobiography, it's very much how I felt about things, it should actually have some legacy. People will be looking at it in 20 years' time. Um, they have written the script so far several times. Um, each of them focuses very much on my women in business era. It doesn't really talk, it, it shows my my son but it doesn't talk about the problems, it doesn't show anything about the philanthropy, it just mentions in flashback my refugee start and they, they, they pick up all the sort of nice bits of, and the fun bits about um, working from home and um, putting a tape recorder on with the sound of somebody typing um, when the phone went so that it sounded as if I was in a nice busy office. Quite a lot of business is make sure that we, you present yourself as strong as you possibly can. They have filmed um, a company reunion that we had last year um, as a way, and I think they'll probably finish up on that. This is the company today. Here, here's this woman in real 50 years on. Yeah. Thank you so much.